Okay, here we are in book one around line um, 71. Let's sort of set the stage. It's always important when you pick up uh, when, where you've left off that you kind of think back on the plot, remember what's going on. It gives you some context and, and somewhere to start. Um, so Gina's been angry and upset about how the Trojans never get hurt. We learned about Aeolus and his cave of winds, and she has started uh, talking to him to try to convince him to let the winds go and um, see, scatter the Trojans and sink their ships. All right, so we're in line 70. Sunt mihi. Um, this is a really important construction in Latin. You can always say um, there is or there are plus the dative case to mean I have. It's called the dative of possession. So mihi is a dative, and it's really a dative of possession. Um, so if you said sunt tibi, there are for you, that's the same thing as saying you have. Or sunt ei, there are for him, means he has. Um, it's sort of just an, another way to, to say that instead of saying I have. Um, it's also in when you say mihi nomen est, my name is, and that's a dative of possession. So sunt mihi is just another way of saying habeo, I have. There are for me, bis means two times or twice, septum. So two times seven is a very poetic way of saying 14. There are for me 14 pristenti, well it's an ablative. Christanti corpore, another ablative, so these things go together. And the book tells you it's an ablative of quality. So it tells you the qualities that something has. So in this case, there's something with the quality of having a sort of outstanding body, or you might say beauty instead of body. Um, and finally, we get our subject, nymphi. This is what she has. There are, for me, 14 nymphs. What kind of nymphs are they? They're nymphs. In English, we would use a genitive of outstanding body. Um, but in Latin, you use an ablative of quality to describe the kind of qualities that these nymphs have. Um, but it's fine to translate it with of, even though that sounds more genitive-y. There are, for me, two times seven of outstanding body nymphs. Um, you might want to say beauty there, because that's what it means. Um, all right, Juno, tell us more about these. Quarum quae forma pulcherima diopea. Um, this is a kind of difficult sentence to start. Uh, I remember I had much trouble with it when I just looked at it. To see two relative um, pronouns right next to each other is confusing. Quarum, with its arum, has to be genitive plural. So we would say of whom. So we're talking about the nymph, so not of what, but of whom. And then quai is another who, but we haven't even gotten to our other sentence yet. So forma, if you scanned it, you would find that that A is actually a long A, so that must be ablative. And your book tells you it's ablative of respect. Pulcherima is a short A. That means it should be nominative. And then we have diopea. So pulcherima describes diopea. And the book rearranges the word order for you, because this is a very confusing part. Um, but we can say, of whom, diopea, who is the most beautiful? And then how is she the most beautiful? Forma, in respect to her, her form is shape or form. Um, so I have 14 nymphs, of whom diopea, Diopea, who is the most beautiful in form, and we haven't gotten the rest of our sentence yet, so we're still waiting for, well, what, what does she do? Um, a little note on pulcherima. It is a superlative adjective. Normally, you see isimos with these uh, superlatives. Words that end in er are irregular, and they go erimus because it's really hard to say polcarissimus. So it just goes polcarimus. So even though there's not that isimus, that's the sort of hallmark of superlatives, um, it's still superlative. 
Um, so you could say she is very beautiful or the most beautiful, and both of those are correct ways to translate the superlative. Um, and they both work fine here. Sometimes one works better than the other. But she can be very beautiful or can she, she can be the most beautiful. Of whom di Diopea, who is the most beautiful in her shape. Okay, tell us more about her. Connubio jungam stabili propriamque dicabo. Uh, connubio, the book tells you it's, it's ablative. This is a long O. It's an ablative of place or means. Um, connubio is um, marriage. So in marriage or with marriage, so place or means. You can translate it either way and it makes sense in English. Yungam. Okay, yungam is a future tense verb. Am is that I form. It's kind of like sum. Sometimes O means I and sometimes M means I. It's also like bomb, boss, spot in the imperfect. M is the I form, the first person singular. And it's future. And it's from the word yungo yungere, which means to join together. I will join. So in marriage, I will join stabili, is also ablative. OK, it goes back to connubio. What kind of marriage? A lasting marriage. Propriam que dicabo. Whenever you have a que, you translate it before the word it's on. So I will join in a lasting marriage or in steadfast wedlock or in lasting wedlock. And propriam dicabo. Propriam with that am is feminine accusative and it refers back to diopea. And dicabo is future tense. It's the I form. Um, I will dedicate. And propria is, it's a word, it means your own or one's own. I will dedicate her as your own. You have to put that her in there to make it make sense in English. I will join and there's an understood you, in lasting wedlock, stabili conubi, lasting wedlock, stable. And I will dedicate her as your own. Be careful with dicabo. It's not the same verb as dico dicere, because that's not the future of dico dicere. It's actually the word dico dicare, A-R-E, first conjugation. They have similar meanings. Dico dicare means to say, to speak, or to tell. And dico dicare means to dedicate something or sort of consecrate it to a certain thing. OK, um, a quick note on some grammar. Why, if yungam and dicabo are both future tense, first person singular, I will do something, why do they have different endings? Oh, the future tense. So the future tense has two sets of endings. It's either am, es, et, amus, etis, etis, ent, or it's bo, bis, bit, bemus, bitis, boot. It depends on what conjugation the verb belongs to. If it's a third or a fourth, it's am, es, et, amus, etis, ent. So yungo goes yungo, yungre, with a short ere. That means it's third conjugation. So if you wanted to make it future, yungam. Bo bis bit, if it's, if it's first or second conjugation. So dico dicare, with an ere, means it's first. So if you want to make it future, you say dica bo. So they're both the same tense the same person and the same number, first person singular, but they have different endings because they are, in fact, different conjugations. So the future is just a little tricky in that way. Um, and I also want to bring up the O in proprium is short because of the mute liquid rule that I will 
rather explain to you in class than on a video. So remind me, the mute liquid rule. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to give you a, a pretty lady. Omnis ut tecu meritus protalibus anus exigat. Omnis means all, and then the ut introduces either a result clause or a purpose clause. It really can be both. Tecum with you. Meritus means merits. <laughs> Pro uh, means for. Talibus means such. And talibus, actually, remember we talked about is and ebus are endings that go together. Meritus and talibus go together. And pro and anus, anus go together. So it's kind of an ABAB, which is interlocked word order. Um, it's kind of a hard case to make, though, interlocked word order, because usually you don't see prepositions as part of interlocked word order, so pro kind of throws it off, but you, you could make a case for this to be interlocked word order. But pro doesn't really modify anos, but they go together. And anos means years. And exigat is finally our verb. It's present subjunctive because of the ut. It's in this result or purpose clause. All so that Talibus meritus are ablative, so we're going to use one of our ablative words, with such merits, she might spend, as the verb, exigat, she might spend many years tecum, with you. Um, pro anos, it doesn't really mean many years, but it means for years. She might, she might be with you for years. Um, so you can see that, that kind of is a result clause. All this you do with the result that she might spend time with you or that she spends time with you. Um, or a purpose clause, you do this in order that she might spend time with you, right, in order to win her from me. So you can translate either way. Et pulcra faciat te prole parentem. And uh, pulcra means beautiful. And if you scanned it, you would find that this pulchra is really a long A, so it's ablative. Fakiat's another present subjunctive, again, after the ut in a purpose or result clause. Te means you. Te is the accusative form or the ablative form. Here it's accusative. But the accusative and ablative of you are the same. Prole, ablative. Haha, pulchra and prole must go together. They're both ablatives. And the book tells you it's an ablative of quality or means. Every ablative could be an ablative of means, really. So there's always means or place or means or quality. And parentem means parent or relative, and the em tells us it's accusative, so it goes with te. And that she might make you a parent or a father, and then how is she going to do this, with beautiful or illustrious offspring, pulchra prole. And there's some great alliteration, pulchra faciat te prole parentem, that PPP alliteration. So you have two subjunctives and a result or purpose clause. Um, you would say that parentem is in apposition to te. Te is the actual direct object. She's going to make you a father. So you and father are both accusative. And parentem is in apposition to te. By means of beautiful offspring or with the quality of having beautiful offspring. You might say with illustrious. I like illustrious offspring. All right, Iolus responds to her. It's just what she wants to hear. Iolus haec contra. Haec is a good uh, basic word to know. It means these things. It's a neuter plural. 
Anytime you have neuters, you can always just use the word thing, right? Like a beautiful thing or a quick thing or a big thing. So hike means these, but because it's neuter, we can say things. Contra means back or against, and there's no verb, so we would have to say he replied with these things back to her, he said these things back to her. Um, contra is that idea of replying, going back. Tuus o regina quid opes explorare labor. Tuus is pretty straightforward. Yours, O queen. Quid opes? Quid is our question word what? And so it introduces an indirect question. He's not asking what, but there's just a little what. Opes is a present subjunctive because of the indirect question. So it's in that phrase or that clause. Opto, optare means to want or to choose. We get the words like option from it or opt. So you want explorare to kind of explore but examine, to look into. And labor is a task. And labor is nominative. Therefore, we can look all the way back to tuus, which was nominative. Yours, O oh queen, what you want to examine, task. So your task, O oh queen, is to examine what you want, it's to look, look into what you want. So the question would be, what do you want? The indirect question is quid optes. You have to look into what you want. Um, there's a thing called an enclosed line, where the first word and the last word um, go together. This isn't really an enclosed line because it, it spans these two lines, so it's, it's an enjambment. But the phrase is an enclosed phrase, because you have to go from tuus to labor. And those things go together. Um, it kind of is like bookends on a phrase. It's, it's a nice little way to, to wrap up your, your phrase. Mihi. Usa capesere fas est. Um, mihi, right? To or for me. Usa. Um, usa are orders. It's a neuter word, so usa is the neuter plural. And in fact, here the book will tell you it's the direct object of our infinitive. So to, we're going to verb the orders, but we don't. We haven't gotten to our verb yet. This is the direct object of capesere, which is a word that's very uncommon. For me, orders to perform. That's what capesere is, to perform. Fos est. Fos is a word that's almost intranslatable. In Latin, fos means it's proper, it's right, it's good. Um, fos is, fos is a, a good word. You like things to be fos. So it is proper for me to perform your orders. So a queen has one task to decide what she wants. Someone like Aeolus, the, the right thing to do is to obey the orders, to perform the orders. He doesn't get to choose what he wants to do. Um, we had kind of that theme earlier about it, he could let go of the reins or pull back the reins when Jove ordered it. So even though he's the king of the winds, he doesn't really have the power to decide. Um, Fos est is called an impersonal. We've seen um, at least one other one of these impersonal. So it doesn't have a subject. It just it is right. It is proper. You're not going to say like I am proper. You are proper. It only exists with est. It is it is right. The opposite of fos is nefos in e f a s, from which we get the word nefarious. Nefos is it's improper. It's uh, it's against what the gods want. To me, he quod cumque hoc regni tu sceptra youmque concilias tu das epulis acumbere diwom. To is definitely the subject. Me, he is again another dative. To or for me. Quod cumque hoc regni. And there's an understood est in here. 
Kodkumkwe means whatever hawk is this, whatever this is, of a kingdom. Regni, that's a partitive genitive of all the kingdoms in the world. Whatever this is of those kingdoms. Whatever this is of a kingdom. And it's very a humble way. It's, it's sort of uh, understatement. Like, oh, oh, this little kingdom. Oh, it's, it's, not too, it's not too great. You know, it's just a little thing. So you for me, whatever this is of a kingdom, you, Skeptra Yawimque Concilias. Um, Skeptra is a accusative plural neuter, and Yoem is another accusative singular, because there's only one Jove. So the scepter and Jove Concilias. Here's our verb. And it's present tense, no subjunctives, no fancy imperatives. It's just indicative. Just like stage one, indicative. So you went over for me to concilias mihi. You went over for me, you know, whatever this is of a kingdom. And then there's another two. You went over the, the scepter and Jove. So you sort of go to bat for me. Um, Skeptra is plural. It's another one of those poetic plurals. Two, das, you give. Um, Epulis accumbere deum. Or you, you grant might be another one. And you can take the mihi again. You grant for me. And our infinitive is actually the direct object. You grant for me to rec recline. And accumbere is always followed by a dative. And that's our epulis. This is the dative plural. Dative plurals and ablative plurals always have the same endings. So is is looks like an ablative, but is in fact a dative. You allow for me to recline at the feasts, and dewalm is really dewarum. We're going to see that as a, a different spelling a lot. Of the gods. So at the feasts of the gods. Nemborum que facis tempestatum que potentem. And, there's our que. Remember, always translate it first. And nemborum of the clouds, facus you make another simple indicative, tempestatum que and the storms, and this is tempestatum is a genitive plural of the third declension. So tempestas, tempestatis is third declension. So genitive plural is um instead of orum. Potentum means ruling over or powerful over. And potentum always takes a genitive, which explains why we have two genitives. You make, and there's an understood me, you make me ruling of the, cl of the clouds and of the storms. So you can say ruling over or powerful over. The, cl the clouds and the storms. Um, oh, there's one other thing I forgot to mention up, up here. In line 78, we have two twos, <laughs> and we have another two in line 79. And repetition of similar or the same word at the beginning of successive clauses is called anaphora, and it's very emphatic. You are the one who does all the stuff. You are the one who does this. So obviously, Iolas is going to give in to her request and give her whatever she wants. And that's the end of his speech, so we'll stop there.